Hello, everybody. Good morning to you. Happy to see you uh, in the House of the Lord uh, broadcast here and live on Facebook. I'm Bob Tronjo along with Zach Reagan. And we've got Rob Bow with us today, this morning. And uh, we're uh, looking forward to having a great time in God this morning with you as we join ourselves unto Jesus and we uh, sit down together in heavenly places in the Lord and we partake of that divine nature that he has provided for us. Praise God. What a privilege it is to be able to enter his courts with praise and uh, to be able to uh, go behind the veil and be able to receive a word from the Lord. And we've entered into a face-to-face -face relationship with him, not from afar off, uh, but up close, intimate. The Lord is communicating with us. Amen. So we don't ever want to take that for granted or think of it as common. It is a, 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 a great privilege and blessing to be in this kind of fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, who we call our Lord and our friend. Amen. That sticketh closer than any other friend. Praise God. So we want to give him the glory this morning for all that he has done, everything that he is yet doing and going to do for the people of God. We're on a journey into the greatness of God. We've left behind of us uh, the walls of religion that have hemmed the people in and have stunted their growth in the Lord, causing them to be boxed in to a certain place or dimension. Well, we have left that, and we are those that have gone on a journey into Christ, into the center of God, to know him in his fullness. And we don't take that lightly. We understand that this is not an ego thing for our flesh man. It is simply because we have heard the voice uh, of our Lord calling us out and to bring us into him. So uh, those, maybe some of you, have just started your journey out of organized religion, out of the boxes of religiosity that have tried to hem you in. And maybe you have been one of the recent called out ones. If so, I want to encourage you today that you're on a journey of life, of glory, of joy, of peace. Amen that you are going to know more peace than you have ever known in all of your life as you go on to know the Lord and to know the fullness of his salvation. God has a plan for creation. Can you say amen? God has a plan that will never fail. Everything, and I do mean everything, is under his control. And God is right on time. And you are right on time in God. Praise the Lord. God has done everything uh, that you could imagine in order to keep us on pace with what he's going to do in our lives. I think back when we were little children, fresh out of our mother's womb, God had already set our path out before him. And uh, even though uh, some of us have gone through a path of uh, addiction or pain or suffering, or confusion, or uh, uh, poverty, or whatever that may be the case, uh, that was still God's plan for us to bring us into this day. It doesn't matter today if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter what your status in life is. It doesn't matter what color of skin you have. It doesn't matter what culture you're of. God has a people that is of every tribe, of every nation, of every culture, because we are a spiritual people. And it doesn't matter about our physical lineage. We're concerned about our spiritual lineage. We all have the same spirit birthed by God, and the same blood flows in all of us. Amen. So there's no room for racism. There's no room for elitism in this word. This word is that which brings people from all stations of life 
and brings them together because no matter who you are or where you're from, we all need Jesus. Praise the Lord. And we're all in that same ship, that same fellowship of, of needing him. And that's why we're here this morning, because we hunger after his righteousness. We hunger after the revelation of his greatness. Amen. And so I, I pray that uh, whatever's said or done this morning will be a blessing to you and that you will, uh, at the end of this uh, service, that you will be able to say it was good to be in the house of the Lord. Praise God. We love all of you. I'm glad if you're uh, joining us live on Facebook, uh, then I welcome you. We also will be recording this and putting it up on YouTube and we have CDs and DVDs that we send out each week. If you want to be on any of those uh, uh, DVD or CD lists, just uh, send your uh, um, um, correspondence to us at P.O. Box 0519, Dixon, D-I-C-K-S-O-N, Tennessee, 37056. And we'll be glad to put you on our mailing list. You can also reach me at my uh, email at R-T-O-R-A-N-G-O, that's rtorango, at comcast.net. Amen. Praise the Lord this morning. And Father, we do praise you. We ask you, Lord, for your strength and your spirit to be with us today. We ask you, Lord, that you will bless everyone that participates in this gathering unto the Lord. I'm asking for those, Lord, that are weak and weary. Hallelujah, that you will strengthen them, almighty God. That, Lord, you will bring them into the high places of your greatness. That, Lord, their eyes will be lifted up into you, Lord, and that they'll see you high and lifted up and your train filling the temple. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm asking you, God, to lift them up into thy greatness. Amen so that they can sit down and know you, their Father, their true Father and Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we just want to give you the praise and honor this morning. Ask you, God, to bless us with your blessings and bless all men everywhere with the knowledge of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I could climb to the top of the highest hill, or I could go to the depths of the deepest hell, or I could crawl through the sands of the desert so bare and my Lord you'd be there or I could walk through this land of darkness and sin or I could stand in the midst of the lion's den or I could toss to and fro on the sea of trouble and my Lord, oh, you'd be there, hallelujah, glory, there's no place that I can go where I do.
when you said, oh, it is done. And my veil began to tear, I knew my Lord. Oh, ye be there. Come on, let's praise him this morning. Hallelujah. I could climb oh, to the top of the highest hill. Or I could go to the depths of the deepest hell. Or I could sprawl through the sands of oh, the desert so bare and my Lord oh you'd be there hallelujah I could stand in the midst Oh, of a lion's den Or I could walk Through this world Of darkness and sin Or I could toss Hey, to and fro On the sea of trouble and care and my Lord I knew you'd be there did you always know he was there amen glory there's no place that I can go where I do not hear you call When you want him to fall And when you say, yes, Lord, it is done hey. And my veil began to tear I knew my God wants him to fall and when he says you know it's done hallelujah and our veil begins to tear I know my Lord he be there and use us for your glory O oh Lord make us instruments of thy praise O oh Lord and your salvation hallelujah 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 we worship the name of Jesus 
We lift you up, O oh Lord, and glorify you in our midst. You're the one, Lord, you're the one. There is no other, O oh Lord. You are the one, oh, you are the one. And we Worship none other, O oh Lord. You're the way, the truth, and the life. The door and the gate, O oh Lord. There is no other way. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lift us, lift us up into thy greatness, O oh Lord. Lift us high into the heavens above. Out of the narrowness of self, into thy heights and depths. Lift us up. Into thy greatness, O oh Lord. O oh, lift us up, hallelujah, into thy greatness, O oh Lord. Come on, let's let them lift us. Lift us high into thy heaven. Out of the narrowness of self Into thy heights and depths Oh, lift us up Into thy greatness Oh, Lord Oh, lift us up Into thy greatness Let them lift you into the greatness. Lift us high into thy heavens above. Out of the narrowness of self. Into thy heights and depths. Oh, lift us up. Into thy greatness, O oh Lord. Come on, sing it. O oh, lift us up into thy greatness, O oh Lord. That'll make everything else small. O oh, lift us high into thy heavens above. Out of the narrowness of self Into thy heights and depths Lift us up into thy greatness O oh Lord Oh, lift us up into thy greatness Oh Lord, Hallelujah, Hallelujah! Handara da masando riande, ikala da masando liande. Oh, let the earth hear the word of the Lord. May the Spirit of the Lord flow upon thee. 
and move thee out of the darkness and into the light. You are the children of the day and not the night. The Lord has given you his light inside of you. He is mighty in the midst of thee. Able to deliver thee out of the mouth of the lion. Able to deliver thee out of the pit of thine enemy. The Lord is his name. Mighty and strong. Able to do all that we have committed unto him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 There's a song that uh, I'm not sure I know the words to. So I better look it up, otherwise I'll do my uh, doo-doo song. Doo-doo, 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 doo-doo. Amen. It's a joy to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. And uh, how thankful we are for the words of life, for the songs of life that match the word that we are uh, singing. Amen. Uh, speaking, our, uh, the songs need to match the word, the message. If we're preaching one thing and singing another thing, then... Uh, uh, that's a conflict but uh, thank God for these songs that Charlotte has written that have been left to us from her life and ministry thank you Lord this is scripture right out of the scripture Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Yet not I, but Christ, he liveth in me. I'm alive in God, crucified with Christ, but nevertheless I live, oh yeah. say that this morning, amen. I'm alive in God, crucified with Christ, but never Yet not I, but it's Christ who liveth in me. I'm alive. 
I'm alive in God, crucified with Christ. Oh, yes, Lord, but never the less. Yes, I live. Yeah, not I. What a mystery. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, yet not I, but it's Christ who liveth in me. Don't you love him today? Hallelujah, glory. Oh, yet not I, but it's Christ who liveth in me. I'm alive in God, crucified with Christ, but nevertheless I live, yet not I. Sing it one more time, amen. Get the revelation. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Oh, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I'm alive in God, crucified with Christ, nevertheless, yes I live, yet not I. Praise and honor and glory and majesty. Wonderful is the Lord and mighty is his name. Be lifted up in the worship of the Lord. Let the praises of our God fill your mouth. For he is worthy worthy the lamb is worthy of all the praise and honor hallelujah Andoro da masandori andoro moshandori andoro mande. God is moving. His spirit is moving. Move with the cloud. Move with the cloud. God is moving on, and we're moving with Him. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Healing wings give us your fly, son of bride, justness arise from our earth, shine forth your light, oh change. 
change our minds from thoughts of death into pure life. Oh, healing wings, yes, Lord, give us your flight. Oh, Son of righteousness, arise from our Shine forth your light Oh, change our minds From thoughts of death Into pure life I really believe somebody's being healed this morning Amen Healing wings Give us your flight Oh, son of right Let's all join together, sing this to our brothers and sisters. Healing wings, give us your fly, son of right, justness arise from our Change our mind, Lord. Change it. Oh, healing wings, give us your flight, son of righteousness. Arise, arise, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. From our Sing that with me, hallelujah. Yes, change our minds from thoughts of death into pure life. Amen, 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 amen. Healing and restoration, I speak unto all of you, hallelujah. The power of God to be released upon you. The authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to be in the words of this prayer, that you will be set free from every affliction, that the Lord will rise you up out of the bed of sorrow and pain, set your feet on solid ground, cause you to rejoice again, cause you to see a new day in your life, a new beginning of the Lord, another page turned, another chapter written, hallelujah. Look up, look up, look up and see the Lord and see him in his majesty. Draw near unto him, draw near unto the Lord and cause your spirit to be quickened and also your body to be quickened and made alive in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. To him be the glory and honor and praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful to worship the Lord. Hallelujah. To give praises unto him. Praise his name. Hallelujah. If that's all that we did, then we could be fulfilled in just praising the Lord. Because um, when he is lifted up, 
we are lifted up with him. And uh, when he is glorified, we are glorified with him. Praise the Lord. So uh, what is his is ours. Uh, can you imagine the scope of that, of what we just said? What is his is ours. We are the heirs of salvation. The heirs of Jesus Christ. Joint heirs with him. He is our elder brother. We have the same name, amen, the same nature as Jesus our Lord. He is the elder, so he has the preeminence. It, nothing is done without him. But at the same time, we are named with him. We are natured with him. And that divine nature is denaturing our Adamic nature. So that uh, as we decrease, he is increased. Amen. And that is the whole scope of this, is that we are decreasing in our self, our self-worthiness, our self-thinking, and he is increasing in us as we center our minds upon him today. Praise the Lord. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So what a privilege that is for us to know that God is doing something great in our midst today. Hallelujah. That has no uh, um, end to it. It goes on and on into the Father. A lot of people don't know this. I don't guess they've ever read that part of the scripture. I don't know. But they think that Jesus is, uh, is go his reign and rule is going to be for eternity. But that really is not so. Uh, Jesus has been given authority and lordship over the kingdom. And God has given that kingdom unto Jesus. And in the kingdom, there is only one king, and that is Jesus. There's only one Lord, and that is Jesus. And all honor and glory and majesty and worship and praise goes to Jesus. Until everything is put underfoot not only in Jesus himself, as it has already been put under the feet of Jesus, it remains that death will be put under the foot of the believers, of his brethren. And once every man and woman and child has been given that same authority and that power and that glory by the time that every man is filled with the fullness of his God and they are ruling and reigning through the name or the nature of Jesus Christ, then at the end, when God is made all in all, Jesus is going to take everything that God has given to him because there can be no exception outside the fact that God is going to be over and in and through all. So there can be no exception to that. So Jesus, after he has won every battle and he has brought forth every victory, that needs to be done, hallelujah, so great. I can't help but praise him in the middle of it, hallelujah. Once he has conquered every foe and secured the entire creation of God, then the scripture says that Jesus himself will offer back unto the Father all things so that God may be all in the all. Praise the Lord. And that is our example, dear ones. 
Jesus is the pattern for us. And our example and pattern is to take this kingdom that we have built in this earth, your own little kingdom, and we are to bring that kingdom and turn that kingdom over to the kingdom of Jesus Christ so that we are no longer sitting on our own throne, but Jesus is sitting on the throne of our heart and of our being. And everything we do and everything we say is because we have seen our Lord do or say that. Jesus said this in the greater sense of it when he said, everything I say and everything that I do, I have seen my Father in heaven say it and do it. I don't do anything, he said, except those things that I have seen and I have heard. Amen. Now in God, you're always going to see these uh, larger things done, and then there's going to be a microcosm of that done in the individual man or woman or child. Uh, so that as Jesus has been given a kingdom that he has secured and offering it back unto the Father, so we, in turning our lives over to the Lord, and our kingdom unto the Lord, we in that microcosm are going to be offering that all up unto Jesus so that there's nothing left in us that is a shadow of our former self. Uh, our, our thoughts are different. Change our mind so that we don't think death we start thinking life. Change our thoughts. Change our, uh, our thinking. Well, there's those that call that of the thinking of the carnal man, stinking thinking. Take that stinking thinking and turn it into thoughts of life and immortality and incorruptibility and glory and majesty. Amen? until God is thoroughly uh, the center of everything that we are about. Now, um, we are headed to that place in the Lord where we start losing our life. I love that song, Yet Not I, and I love that scripture. <laughs> Hallelujah, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. And this life that I once lived through faith, I no longer live through my own faith. I live it through the faith of the Son of God. Uh, we live, yet not I, but Christ. And it has always amazed me about that scripture in Galatians 2, how that it uses the personal uh, pronoun I as different uh, parts of us to where I, I am crucified with Christ. And then you have the term nevertheless, nevertheless, that's not the end of the story. We're not just living in crucifixion, amen? We're not just living in a crucified state. The crucifixion, the cross was not the end of the story. The cross was a means to an end, hallelujah. Yet, not I, uh, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I, the same I, but a different I, I live. The I that lives is not the singular I that was crucified. The I that lives is the I that came out of the resurrection. Because crucifixion leads to 
resurrection. Suffering leads to ruling and reigning. Amen. And, uh, uh, and, and so it says that I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not that I that I was crucified as, yet not I, but Christ. In other words, I am swallowed up into the Christ. So it is Christ that lives in me. Christ has become my life. And so even though I live, I don't live according to my own ability, according to my own life force, according to my own identity. I am swallowed up in the I that am Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. But that is why God, it's amazing to see the things that God has put together and how they work. Uh, I, uh, I believe Zach mentioned it Wednesday night, and I, I might have mentioned it last week. I don't know. I don't re remember. But uh, I am starting the third volume of the ongoing writing that I have uh, had going uh, for quite some time now on the house that God built. This will be volume three. And uh, it's, uh, it's titled is Building the House. And once you see how God has done something in this uh, body that is made in the image and the likeness of our God, then you understand if we can get a hold of how God designed us, then Paul uses this body as an example of the church, how the church should uh, operate. Now, if Paul lived in this day, he wouldn't be just talking about hands and feet and heads and um, the gross parts of this body. If Paul lived in this day, he'd be talking about DNA, he'd be talking about RNA, he'd be talking about the human cell, the uh, cytoplasm, which is the outer court, the nucleus, which is the holy place, and the nucleolus, which is the holiest of all. He would take these patterns and he would reveal God out of those. Well, Paul isn't here, but we are. And if we follow after the example of Paul, we won't stop at the gross anatomy. We will go into the, the um, uh, microbiology of our body uh, and, and into the microscopic. And we will start looking at uh, what makes us live. How does this house live? And, and as I've said many times before, if you're waiting for a calendar date to be the Feast of Tabernacles, then you have the wrong idea. It's not a calendar date. The Feast of Tabernacles is a people. We are literally in our pattern of our body a walking feast of tabernacles, plural. Notice how tabernacles is not a feast of a tabernacle. It's a feast of tabernacles. Well, in our case, over a hundred trillion of those tabernacles that they themselves, each, each cell, which we have over a hundred trillion individual cells that abide in a house together and that work together. You know, it's amazing. If I was to, just a simple movement, like if my nose itched, for me to take my hand and move toward my nose and to be able to scratch my nose takes an untold number of cells to make that happen. 
And without poking me in the eye or smacking me in the nose, uh, and I can literally stand up here not holding on to anything and not fall over because my body is constantly balancing itself on my feet. Uh, if I didn't have that cooperation, I would teeter and totter and eventually fall over. And this uh, Ezekiel vision is a vision, if nothing else, it is a vision to show the complexity of the world of God and how that world causes things to come forth out of the center of it that have direction and order and arrangement. Now, some people think that God is just haphazard, that God's out here doing stuff, just doing stuff without any order or, or arrangement. Or that God at times must be out of control because otherwise if he is in control, this never would have happened to me. And uh, my whole life would be nothing but a blessing, nothing but health, prosperity, and, uh, and all the good things. And yet all of our lives have had times of great distress, of going through challenges, of having to overcome things, and having to persevere and endure life until we come through it and out on the other side of it. But God is in order. I remember when I was, I was saved when I was 15 years old. And I remember at the age of 16, a, a, a new convert in the Lord. And, and God drew me and he started speaking to me at the age of 16. He start, I started feeling this... Um, these thoughts that weren't my own thoughts. And I recognized that in the midst of my own thoughts, every once in a while, I would have a thought that I perceived to be not my own thought, but it was a thought that got my attention. And that's how it began with me. But I remember at the age of 16, and it was a strange thing for a 16-year-old to do. <laughs> no doubt. People were thinking, there's something wrong with that Taranjo kid because he's just not right. He's just not right. He's doing things that just don't make sense. And I found myself in a park on a sunny day when I should have been out playing baseball or doing the other things that all that I would normally be doing, I found myself laying prostrate on a, um, a, a bench, a picnic bench, with my head hanging over the edge of it. And this thought came into me that I had to study the ant. Now, I didn't know of any scripture, and yet that's in the Bible. Study the ants and see how they live and how they supply. And even though they're little ants, they never have a need. They, ha they have their provision of the Lord. And so I, I was looking down, and right underneath me was this pretty good-sized ant, ant, ant hill, And when I started looking at these ants, it looked like total chaos. You know how that is. If you've ever looked at an anthill for any amount of time, it's like everybody's going off and yeah, doing their own thing and walking all over each other. And, and at times they're doing the zigzag pattern and going all over the place. And the more that I watched them, I thought, this, this, you know, they're, they're all mixed up. They don't know what they're doing. There's no order to their, uh, what they're doing. And I spent, I'll bet you, three hours watching that anthill, just laying on that bench. 
and watching these ants. And after a while, I saw a pattern there. I started noticing how haphazard they seem to be, and yet the amount of food that they were bringing into that anthill was amazing. And each one seemed to know their purpose, that their purpose was to bring food back to the nest. Now, to this day, I'm not really clear how ants communicate. I know it's by uh, some kind of a chemical smell that scientists say that they go by. But I really don't have that all clear in my head. How in the world a little, little bitty ant can know what to do in a community of ants? And yet, if you go to any place that really deals with ants, and if you've ever gone to some place that has a glass enclosure that shows what goes on under the soil, you see all of these tunnels and uh, arrangement and order that these ants are going by. And the communication that they're going by puts each one of them in a different classification. There's soldier ants. There's ants that protect the nest. There's ants that are drones that all they do is just go out and gather. Uh, There are uh, ants that, uh, uh, queen ants that birth eggs and and their purpose is to keep that birthing going. Uh, it's, It's quite a production. But it reminded me in days later, it reminded me how God has order and arrangement. But it's not the order and the arrangement of men. Now, on first glance with Ezekiel, it's a mystery. He's seen so much. Now, as I told you in the other lessons on this, Ezekiel is being shown something by God because Ezekiel was going to go through a ministry of bringing a word of judgment to the rebellious house of Israel who were in captivity. And God was going to use this prophet in many strange and weird ways. (laughs) He is quite a uh, uh, he, he has to know that God has sent him to do these things. He can't just go by when I was a young man saying, oh, that might be a thought that's not my own thought. He had an up-close personal visitation by God, and that empowered him to be able to refer back to that experience when he's lying on his right side for months and lying on his left side for months. And all of these weird things that Ezekiel went through, which we'll get into some other time in the study, seemed like he was a man that was uh, just doing things for no reason. And I'm sure others would say, what in the world's wrong with that crazy Ezekiel? Why is he doing that? And why is he doing that? And I'm sure that people today look at the kingdom people and they say, you know, uh, what are you guys doing? You're, you're here with, uh, in these small groups. And you don't have any, a, a large amount of people following after you. And yet, you keep speaking about things that most of us don't know anything about. And Jesus, when you look at Jesus, just when people started following him, that's when he came out with, a, with, with some parables. <laughs> and the parables were like, huh? To those that were gathered around him. In fact, there was times that the disciples themselves didn't get it. And they would take him aside and say, Master, what, do you, what does that parable mean? What, what, what are you trying to say to us? And so he would have to explain it to them. But to the crowds, it was a parable 
that they couldn't figure out. Because it was not given unto them, his purpose at that time was not to bring an earthly kingdom. He was talking about spiritual things that were meant for a spiritual people, not even in that day, but in a day to come, which is this day, that people could read out of a book these things that he had done. And the book itself, the Bible, is not a complete book of everything that Jesus said or did. Do you hear me this morning? It's not a complete book of everything that he said and did. Because if, if, if God was to uh, cause a written word to be given to this world of everything that Jesus said and did that should have been written about him, the world itself would not contain the books. It would fill the world up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So these were spiritual things said at that time to a carnal-minded, religious-minded society and people that in, in, in uh, two days of millenniums later, there would come forth a people that would have a spiritual mind to interpret them with. Amen. And so Ezekiel is going to be asked to go and prophesy Judgment unto a rebellious house of Israel. And there is a lot to get into on this, uh, on this vision. And he refers to it in other places in the book of Ezekiel, which we'll get into. But for now, we want to go to Ezekiel 1. I want to just read through this so that we read the whole thing again and refresh ourselves. Uh, so from Ezekiel 1, verse 1, and I'm reading out of the Amplified. Now when I was in my 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month. Do you know I can tell you exactly when I was saved? A lot of people can't. Uh, some people were raised in church, so they never really had a, com a, a, a real dramatic going from darkness to light experience. But uh, uh, I, was, uh, I first met Jesus in a way of salvation um, on September the 5th, 1965. And it was in a little bitty church. And if that church was still standing, which it's not, um, I could take you to the pew, and, uh, to the aisle way, and to the seat that I was at when I first came into the knowledge of Jesus Christ and made him Lord of my life. Now, not everybody can, but notice what Ezekiel does. He says, I was 30 years old, and it was in the fourth month of the year and it was on the fifth day of that month. It was embedded in him, ingrained in him. That was when everything with Ezekiel changed. He was a prophet, but only in the eyes of men. But this was going to set Ezekiel on a journey. That it took this kind of an appearing to be able to uh, sustain him on the persecution that he was going to receive. Can I tell you this, every one of you, because I love you, you need an experience with Jesus Christ. You need more than just word. You need more than just someone singing to you. You need an experience, a personal, intimate, face-to-face -face experience with Jesus Christ. How do I get that? Well, I can only tell you in, in my instance where I sought after Jesus. That initial thing that I had on that uh, fifth day of September, 1965, was only the beginning of it. 
Then I had to actually follow after this Jesus that I knew nothing about except the love that I felt from that presence, the weight that fell off of my chest when I, uh, when I uh, recognized him. And I knew nothing other than that. And when I think about all of the strange things that people were doing around me, it's God's able to cut through all of the soulishness of men and go right to the heart of us, amen, to get a hold of us. But then I had to follow after that. And uh, I was very serious about it. I recognized that God had found me, looked for me and found me under a design of a plan in my life at the year of 15. Up until then, uh, I was as far from God as you could get in an atmosphere that was as far away from God as you could get. An environment that today would call, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Non-functional, dysfunctional. And God found me there because he had designed it from the, before the foundations of the world, he had set my feet in order. Although I looked like an ant going all through the world with no purpose or direction at 15 years old, uh, already getting involved in some very, very destructive things, God had my feet ordered to end up at a certain place at a certain time for him and him alone to appear to me and uh, harpazo me, harpoon me, and drag me into his boat. He sought after me and he apprehended me for his purpose in his kingdom. And so I had to follow after that. And the way that I did was I sought him. I seeked after him. Now this church I was saved in was services 365 days a year. Every night we had service. And um, I think they they called them revival centers. And that was the way the early Pentecost did. Uh, And um, for two years, I never missed a service. And in the midst of all of that, I would find myself... Uh, On the weekend, I would find myself over at a friend's house, and uh, there was a little group of of friends that I had that I had found in other churches that were serious about what God was doing also. And we would gather in his basement. He had a finished basement at his house. And we would put on records that um, uh, of uh, spiritual songs, And we would, uh, way into the uh, nighttime, uh, early uh, early morning, uh, cry out to the Lord and ask him to show us what he would have us do. That was at 16. So by the time that I reached 17, I knew there was a calling on my life to be a minister. And I knew by then that I had to exercise what was in me, so I became, uh, I moved to another church and I became a youth leader. Uh, I became the janitor. I became song leader. (laughs) I, I had more hats than I had hands. And my ministry started to exercise itself, but I still sought after the Lord. We never stop seeking more. There is always more of God, personal more, not living vicariously off of somebody else. We need that to a certain extent to strengthen us. Like these broadcasts, thank God for them. Thank God for teaching. Thank God for the times that someone like myself can come in and because I've been around for a long, long time in this word. I can maybe 
say some things that would maybe uh, uh, cut your journey short a little bit and be able to show you the way to go until the Lord is able to speak to you personally. But you have to have that experience where it's not just uh, something you're hearing someone say or seeing someone do, but it becomes your life in God. It becomes your journey. And then as you um, still gather together with others, you become a life giver instead of a, a life taker. You become a life giver. And this can happen, as I say, at any age, at, at any time. Uh, God can continue and start to speak to us. Don't ever limit that in God. And so Ezekiel knows the exact day of the year that, and he remembers where he was exactly. I, I'll bet you Ezekiel could take you back to right beside the river Shebar where he was at and be able to show anyone, this is where I received the vision from God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We want that. We want God to show us something so dramatic, so to have an experience that is so life-changing that we could point anyone to that place in that time, whether it's in our own home or whether it's in a gathering or whether it was in a car or whatever. We can let people know I was here at this particular time and the Spirit of the Lord came upon me. Hallelujah. And when it came upon me, God showed me. And whatever he shows us at that time is going to be with us for the rest of our life. Praise the Lord. And he said, he was as, as I was in the midst of captivity beside the river Shebar in Babylonia, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which, by the way, was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly, thank you, Lord, to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buza, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Shebar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And as I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north. He knew the direction. It came out of the north and a great cloud with a fire enveloping it and flashing continually. A brightness was about it and out of the midst of it there seemed to glow amber metal. Out of the midst of the fire. Notice how many times he notes that it was out of the midst of all of this, out of the center of it, out of the midst of it. Hallelujah. And out of the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures or cherubim. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Now, notice the total likeness of these cherubim and by living creatures I believe that what it meant was that they live continually they had an inner life that was continually enveloping itself and boiling forth with life it was like a artesian uh, well, like a spring of water that comes out from a source that continually brings forth life. And, and this is uh, 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 the categorization of how we are coming and being changed into a new man, a new being, where there is not going to be a limited life but an endless life, a life without end, life as God has it, Zoe life. Oh my, hallelujah. 
Life that continues to live on. Hallelujah. No end to it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And this is what he noticed about these was that these creatures had the likeness of a man. In other words, they didn't represent anything else but a man. With all of their parts and all that was going on with them, the likeness of the totality of it was a man. Amen. It always, everything that God does has to do with man. Everything that God has ever done has to do with man. It is mankind that God has fashioned after himself. It's mankind that God has set the heavens in, uh, in, in order for. Hallelujah. He hung the stars in the heavens at night for man. So, and the moon is there strictly for man, according to the scriptures, so that man would never be totally without light. Can you say amen and praise the Lord? It was all for us. Everything was for us. And everything that the scripture talks about has to do with God's creation, with mankind. Amen. And Jesus came for man. When, when he took on flesh, he took on flesh and became as man so that he could deliver man out of a, a, a destructive nature, out of a corruptible nature. It was all for man. So everything in this world, and that's why I was telling you about what I'm writing on, everything in this world, once we have a spiritual mind operating in us, everything we see will be in relationship to man. And inside man, which is God. The God that lives inside of man. Inside of man is the city of God. Inside of man is the throne of God. Inside of man are the 24 elders. Inside of man dwells the four living creatures. Amen. All of it is centralized in man. And when man comes together, it is all amplified. As we gather this morning into the Lord, everything that takes place this morning, because there's, there's uh, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there will I be in their midst, means an amplification. You in me and me in you, and we in him. I pray you can feel the power of that. I pray you understand why we need each other, why we can't go off by ourselves. We have to, whatever we receive when we're by ourselves has to come into the midst of God's people. It has to have a demonstration and an expression into the midst of God's people because that's the reason why God is revealing himself to us so that we can reveal him to others. Can you get that? Amen. So the likeness of a man was about the whole four living creatures. But individually, each one had four faces. And each one had four wings. Now this is something that Charlotte and I did not understand for a long time. And I still don't understand the totality of it. But Charlotte and I started years ago, many years ago, Charlotte and I started seeing four, four, four. A lot of people see numbers. Some people see twos. Some people see threes. But Charlotte and I started seeing four, four, four all the time. Four, four, four. It became hilarious. Um, 
We would wake up in the middle of the night, and we had one of those digital clocks that, that displayed the numbers. It wasn't a hand, but it was just numbers. We'd wake up in the middle of the night, look at the clock, and say 444. Um, and it got to where I started saying, beating my head and saying, God, what is this? Why, 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 why would you show us 444? And, uh, and I started saying, oh, there's nothing to it. Must just be, you know, when you buy a new car, you start seeing that car everywhere. You, you get four numbers and you start seeing them everywhere. I don't know. And I'm sitting on the couch, and we have the TV on. And I said, Charlotte, there, there, there's, I don't understand it. There's, I, I just don't know if there's anything to it. Us seeing this number, 444, everywhere we go, 444. And she'd say, well, I, I, I think God's trying to tell us something. An old carnal Bob would say, I don't know. And right when I say that, this commercial is one of those loud uh, car salesmen. And he says, that's right, folks, for $444 down, you can buy this car right here. And they got 444 all over the screen. <laughs> and so I said, I give up. I give up. I don't know what it means. I give up. I'll just keep. And to this day, I keep seeing 444. Well, I don't know if it has anything to do with it. But. You see 444 in this representation. You see four living creatures, and they have four faces, and they have four wings. So if that was to show us that it is time for us to understand how God is joining things together to create something greater than the individual parts? Perhaps. I'm sure that that's a part of it, maybe, but maybe not the totality of it. But that much I, I can say I believe that because a single number four is just four. Put another four with it, it becomes eight. Put another four with it, it becomes 12, and so on. And there is a multiplication, an exponential gaining by things that are joined to one another. And I told you that, to me, what this vision is going to show us eventually is the multiplication, the exponential power when heaven and earth start to come together. When... Uh, we start seeing not uh, 12 tribes, but we start seeing 24 elders. When we're, when we're seeing an exponential number that increases itself, and in the increasing of itself, it, it, is, it is made up of numbers that represent just an individual value, but taken together, they represent a much greater value. Hallelujah. Now, it's great that, there, that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. And just that single Son has, has done more at the cross and through his resurrection than you could ever, ever, ever imagine. But I'm telling you that by the time Jesus is done, he is going to be seen in Mount Zion with not just himself, but with 144,000 others that are just like him. Hallelujah. He will have exponentially multiplied himself in power and in glory and in stature and in uh, authority over and over and over again. And of course, 144,000 has the base number of 12 to it and even four into it. Hallelujah. So we see that God has taken something, amen, through 2,000 years ago, uh, uh, the Son of God came, and he was taken up. And before he was taken up, while he was teaching on earth, he said something that people quote a lot. I don't know if they, under, if they truly understand the, the power of it, but he said that these things 
that I do, you shall do greater. And then he talked about exponential greatness because I go to my Father. And where I am, there I'll bring you also. Hallelujah. This is exponential. Glory to God. And right at this moment, the power of God that is going to be beyond Pentecost, beyond miracles, beyond all the things that you and I have ever heard of or imagined, there's going to be greater things done because we are being joined unto our source, unto our Lord, our King, hallelujah. And then we take our places under the King to be priests and kings called unto God. That's no light thing. That is an exponential power of Melchizedek. Melchizedek represents Jesus, and Jesus was both priest and king. And Melchizedek was a a, a likeness of Jesus, represented Jesus. And now you and I understand that we ourselves are being called into that very same priest-king office or, or, or calling. And we are going to represent a twofold power in God of priest and king together. Hallelujah. So that uh, both that which was seen in the priesthood and that which was seen in, the, seen in the kingship of Jesus, being from the tribe of Judah, the king, the lion of Judah, we are seeing now that we are also going to be those uh, that, that represent and are, are going to be found in the same image and likeness of what John the Revelator saw when he said that I turned around and saw this man that was in the form of the son of man. And he had all of the array of a king, of a warrior, and he had paps of the priesthood. He was was a nurture warrior. He was a warrior priest. He was that which was not just one thing. He was many things. And this is the exponential power of heaven and earth coming together. We have to see all of this in relationship to that. So we have these four living creatures. Each one had four faces and each one had four wings. Now let me um, go on here and then we're going to read a little bit. And their legs were straight legs, meaning that they didn't bend. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. They were, instead of horizontal, they're vertical. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Everywhere that something is that is in the midst of God comes forth as burnished bronze. As it says in the uh, fourth chapter, I believe it was. And out of the midst of it, there seemed to glow amber metal. God is... um, forging us in the fire of his presence. And uh, he is turning our uh, swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. And then he can also turn our pruning hooks into spears and our plowshares into swords. Whatever God chooses to express, notice that It's not something that he throws the sword away and goes out and forges a plowshare to bring in. He takes the same metal that made the sword and he uses that to change the function of it. It's the same metal, but God forms it into another function. Its form uh, dictates its function, Uh, but it's the same metal. We are changeable in the, in the Lord. We are constantly pliable. We are constantly uh, being forged by God from order to order to order. 
it has been a change of order, but it is the same spirit of the word that moves through every order. It's the same Holy Spirit that moves through everything, and it changes the form, but not the substance. Hallelujah. I've gone through many forgings in the Lord, and I have found that every time he's done that I am able and, and equipped to do whatever the Lord wants me to do. You find that also, amen? Uh, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on the four sides. Now, there's a reason why there is the hands of a man under their wings. We'll get into later on how those hands are used in subsequent uh, chapters in Ezekiel. They turned not when they went, but went everyone straight forward. No uh, shadow of turning is within them. They have received a word, and nothing can turn them out of the way. They are linear. They are a straight line. They are direct. You remember that vision I told you that I had last week? I was in the church during a conference. God pushed me on my face on the carpet, and I saw through a vision these heavenly beings come in to the place, and I said that I couldn't understand. They, they came in in a certain attitude, in a certain uh, straightforwardness. That's exactly what I see in what Ezekiel's saying. They came in that same way. They weren't just milling around. They came in with a mission, and they accomplished that mission. And as you remember, I saw them pouring oil over the heads of the people, preparing them for the day that is at hand. And straightforwardness, dreadfulness was in the midst of them. They were straightforward, and, and nothing was going to dissuade them or, or, or distract them from what they had to do. That is a ministry that is being birthed today. It is straightforward. Hallelujah. They're not looking around to see if they have man's approval. They're not looking to see um, the sights and the sounds. They are, they are entirely imprisoned and caught up into the mind of their God. They are moving as one with him, with a purpose in them. It's time for us to quit playing the child's games of church and for us to start move, moving as a living creature that Ezekiel uh, talked about and John the Revelator talked about. And the four of them had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. What does that remind you of when you talk about wings touching each other? Well, you have to be thinking about uh, the holiest of all, where uh, the uh, cherubim, the, the wings were overshadowing the uh, mercy seat and the wings were touching uh, over over the uh, uh, mercy seat again, it is the exponential power that God is always moving in. It's not one thing; it's more than one. Hallelujah! And it gives power and authority, and 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 gathers strength into it. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And by the way, you are the tabernacle, and the uh, the ark of the Lord is in you. They'll, no sense in people trying to find the ark. Hallelujah. The ark, hallelujah, is in you and I. And uh, the holy, holiest of all in the holy place is in us. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, as for the likeness of their faces, they each had the face of a man in front and each had the face of a lion on the right side and the face of an ox on the left side. 
The four also had the face of an eagle at the back of their heads. Now, um, as you know, uh, John the Revelator, Saul, also a similar vision uh, as God was showing him in the fourth chapter of Revelation, the throne and the throne room. And uh, I want to go to that and uh, have us read that a little bit. He says, and this is in the book of Revelation, the fourth chapter. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat upon the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And, their head, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Notice more than one thing going on here, more than one detail. All of it speaks of exponential combined power and glory and majesty. And God has always been a plurality of things in one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, which makes him, which makes his greatness so expanded. Hallelujah. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Beast is a bad translation there. Uh, it should be creature. And the first creature was like a lion. And the second creature like a calf. And the third creature had a face as a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. Exactly the same components that uh, we see uh, in Ezekiel's vision. Not by chance at all. Now, J. Preston Eby in my viewpoint, is the greatest writer that I've ever read concerning the truth of the kingdom of God. And his series, as everyone knows that's ever read him, are complete and uh, full of truth, and he, he covers it all. When he starts a series, it covers everything. And it is all life for me anyway. I, I respect him immensely. But this is what he uh, has written in his uh, series, From the Candlestick to the Throne. And this is part 71, the four living creatures and the 24 elders. It's a continuation. And this is what he says um, in the King James, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Revelation 4 and 4. In the Amplified, it says, 24 other thrones surrounded the throne and seated on these thrones. Instead of seats, Amplified reads out of the original language, thrones. So there was more than just one throne. There was the, the throne and around about it, a replication of smaller thrones around and about. And seated on these thrones were 24 elders arrayed in white clothing with crowns of gold upon their heads. And this is what Brother Eby writes. The Greek word for elders is presbyters. By the way, the word Presbyterian comes from that. And I am reminded of the story about the little girl who came home from her Presbyterian Sunday school and her mother asked her what they had talked about. 
We talked about heaven, the little girl replied. Well, what did they say about it, her mother asked. The teacher said that there were only 24 Presbyterians there. <laughs> then E.B. says, seriously, elders were representatives. We know that Israel had elders and that elders were ordained in the early churches to rule and to represent the entire church. The 24 elders in the book of Revelation bear a special signification for they are represented as distinct from both the four living creatures in the midst. And this is the same language and this is the same emphasis. In the midst, in the midst, in the midst. Rob, we are in the midst. <laughs> Folks, we are in the midst of it. We're not on the outskirts. God is positioning us in the midst of it all. Praise the Lord. I give him glory for that. Hallelujah. Uh, they are represented as distinct from both the four living creatures in the midst of the throne and the great multitude before the throne. These elders occupy a unique position described as roundabout the throne, yet upon thrones. In order to fully appreciate the scenery here drawn by the Spirit, we need to go back and examine one particular of the order established by God among the people of Israel after they came up out of the land of Egypt. Now, this is really something to pay attention to. I've read a lot of commentaries about the four living creatures, but Brother Eby is the first one that actually brings out, I believe, a correct um, um, distinction about these four faces of, of the living creatures. So he says it's important that we get a clear idea not only of the structure of the tabernacle of Moses. I'm sorry, I want to go up ahead here. We need to go back and examine one particular of the order established by God among the people of Israel after they came up out of the land of Egypt. It is important that we get a clear idea not only of the structure of the tabernacle of Moses, but also of the arrangement of both the people and the priesthood in relation to it. Now you notice I say that God always has order and arrangement in everything he does. Even if it doesn't make sense to us at the time, there's always going to be an overall view that shows the significance of what God is doing. What do we see then? In the second chapter of Numbers, we find the order given for the encampment of Israel as they journeyed through the wilderness. The camp of Israel, as it was established in Sinai, formed a hollow square. In the center of the hollow was the tabernacle of Moses. Around the tabernacle, Israel was divided into four camps. One camp of three tribes on the east side, another camp of three tribes on the south side, another camp of three tribes on the west side and the last camp of three tribes on the north side. There is to be one ensign for each camp of three tribes. Judah was to be the head tribe of the first encampment and they were to camp on the east side toward the rising of the sun. That's in Numbers 2, 3, 9. The tribes of Issachar and Zebulun were to camp with Judah around his standard or ensign, which ensign was the lion. Therefore, the flag of the tribe of Judah with the lion of gold on a background of scarlet was erected in front of the camp of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Next in order was the camp of Reuben on the south side along with the tribes of Simeon and Gad. These three tribes were to camp around the ensign of Reuben, which ensign was the man. On this flag, a man was represented against a background of gold. The third camp was made up of the tribes of Manasseh, 
and Benjamin with Ephraim as the head tribe to camp on the west side of the tabernacle. The ensign of the tribe of Ephraim was the ox. The flag of Ephraim had a black ox with a background of gold. The final camp was the camp of Dan, together with the tribes of Asher and Naphtali. History shows that the ensign of the tribe of Dan was the eagle. This flag had an eagle of gold on a background of blue. The tabernacle with its courts set in the midst, in the midst of so many thousands of saved and happy Israel must have been an imposing sight and all absorbing scene of wonder to the whole nation as well as to each one of the mighty host. In this arrangement, we see the same typical picture under different symbols as that presented us in chapters 4 and 5 of the Revelation. The most holy place was the abode of the God of Israel among his people. When the tabernacle was set up as described in Exodus chapter 40, then the Shekinah, the cloud of God's glorious presence, covered the whole tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It is interesting to observe that while the cloud of God's glory rested upon the entire tabernacle complex, the glory of the Lord also filled the tabernacle, thus designating the most holy place as the dwelling place or the tabernacle of God. Amen. So we see by this that God in the vision of Ezekiel was foretelling uh, the uh, vision that John the Revelator was going to have. And that we see the same imagery and the same things pronounced in Ezekiel as we do in the book of the Revelation. So that, uh, to me, is what God wants us to understand about what he's doing in the midst of this people. Hallelujah. So uh, going back to Ezekiel, we want to see that their wings touched one another and they turned not when they went but went every one straight forward and as for the likeness of their faces they each had a face of a man and each had the face of a lion on the right side and the face of an ox on the left side the four also had the face of an eagle at the back of their heads an exact representation of the living creatures in the throne room of God, not just uh, around and about the throne, in the midst of the throne is where these living creatures are at. Uh, what else can we say about the throne room that relates to us? The other thing that relates to us that go corresponds with the living creatures is that in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, there's a mighty wonder, a woman who is in array of power and authority and the grace of God upon her. A crown of stars. She is obviously a woman of immense strength and power. And she's pregnant and she's getting ready to give birth. And the dragon appears and stands in front of her to devour the child as soon as it comes out of her. The child is a man-child. The man-child is that which the scripture says is going to rule with the rod of iron. He's, he's going to uh, do the will of his father. He's going, going to rule with strength and power and dominion, dominion. Uh, everything having to do 
with these scenarios has to do with dominion, the power over these things that are destroying creation. God wants to give us authority and dunamis, exousia and dunamis, authority and explosive power. Dunamis is where we uh, find the root word for dynamite. Exousia is the authority to use that dynamite. Without exousia, dynamite would be powerless. But when it's, uh, it would only be uh, used haphazardly and without uh, would be more destructive than it is helpful. But again, the exponential power of bringing the two together and through authority and dunamis, God is ruling and reigning in his people, bringing everything under his control. Amen. And we see this having to do with this exponential power that God keeps showing us through these scriptures. In the midst of the living creatures, there was what looked like burning coals of fire, like torches. What did it say in the, in the uh, Revelation, the fourth chapter? There were seven lamps moving back and forth before the throne. And the seven lamps were more than just lamps. Again, exponential. Again, more than what they seemed to be. They were the seven spirits of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. An exponential number of the power of God in the spirit. Hallelujah. The seven exponential expressions. They, they, were, they represent the, the seven angels, the seven churches, the seven trumpets, the seven spirits of God all of this exponential power and glory. Can you see how we have just been one dimensional? We have just been uh, looking at things in individual parts, but now we are starting to see things in the fullness of it. Now we are seeing God all together in it. Oh, hallelujah. I, 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 I'm not shouting. I'm not screaming at you. I'm not running and dancing. But I'm telling you, I'm speaking to you the most powerful word that I have ever spoken to you before. There is an exponential growing out, coming forth of God in our midst that the world has ever seen before. It is not just one thing. It is a multitude of things. It is the manifold wisdom of God. Hallelujah. It is the power, glory to God, of God in the midst of it all. It's not the, just the first day. It's not just the second day. It's not just the third day. It's all those days together. It's not just Passover. It's not just Pentecost. It's not just tabernacles. It's all three made one in him. Can you believe God for that with me? Hallelujah. And that's why we need to know what God wants us to be doing with this. We know now that God is showing us something on these lines that we now need to know, what must I do, Lord? For right now, we need to hear it. For right now, we need to believe it. For right now, we just need to let the Lord show us what he's doing. Hallelujah. But we hear first, then we do. But we don't do without hearing. We're not the guy that runs out ahead of the messenger of God uh, before the battle's over, running to be first to come to the king with a report. Because when he gets to the king, the king says, how goes the battle? And he says, I don't know. I left before it was done. He says, go over there and stand over there. You ran without a message. And then the real messenger comes after waiting to see and hear and then see the end of the matter and then comes to the king and tells him how the battle truly went. We don't want to be that guy that runs ahead and just says stuff. We want to be on course. We want to be straight ahead. We want God to open up the doors of heaven for us and show us what he's going to do in this generation. This is our generation. You and I were held back 
into God, reserved back into him. Understand this. You were not born of any other age because you were set, appointed by God to come to earth at this particular time so that you would hear a particular word that would set your house in order, that would establish you and root you and ground you in Jesus and the truth that he is so that you can go forth and do exploits in him. Hallelujah. It wasn't given to any other generation. God held you back. Why in the world did he hold you back? Hallelujah. You aren't any better than anybody else that ever walked this earth. And yet we have come here with a calling upon us, a choosing upon us, an election of God upon us. Not to do those things that have already been done, but to go and show a more excellent way, a way of power and authority, of exponential fullness in him. Hallelujah. Well, I feel to stop here. Praise the Lord. I could go on all day with this. It is just a tremendous unfolding for me in my life. Hallelujah. The exponential power that we are being joined to heaven and earth together hallelujah we are coming into the throne room brother Eby calls it the throne zone and I like that the throne zone we have not been called to be out in the fringes that man child I was talking about, the dragon never did get him. He was caught up. As he was birthed, before the dragon could snatch him in its jaws, the Spirit of the Lord caught that child up into the throne. And he was forged and taught. Hallelujah, the ways of his father so that he might return again and deliver the woman, the church, the new Jerusalem out of her persecution and bring her forth in beauty and honor as a bride of Christ. It's going to take the man child in order to bring the bride forth and to make her ready for her king. He has to first destroy all the enemies. He has to first pull down strongholds, pluck up roots of weeds and of thorns that have grown in the place of God. He has to go out and dethrone kings and do battle with principalities and powers and thrones and dominions and bring them down so that there's only one throne, one king, one dominion in all of the earth and in all of heaven. Oh, hear the word of the Lord. Gird your loins about. Eat, because your journey is going to be long. Because the Lord is not bringing you into an easy place of comfort and of swaddling. But the Lord is calling you forth to be a warrior priest to learn the ways of the warrior and how to have the heart of a priest so that God might set you in array in the heavens so that God might join you together 144,000 strong, an exponential company of uh, priest warriors that are going into the greatness of God together who have upon them the name of their Lord and King. Hallelujah. And they are dressed in white linen. Praise the Lord. He's dressing us, taking off of us uh, our filthy rags of self-righteousness, our filthy rags of self-worship, uh, our filthy rags of uh, lust for money and fame and fortune. Those things which are rags in the, in the true 
reality of things. Uh, and God is going to say, take those rags off, off of him and give unto him garments of praise and of worship and of righteousness. May God be with you all during this time. May God continue to show you what needs to be done. Bow your knee before him. Confess him as your Lord and King. He will surely bring you forth and he will surely set your path in order and bring you into your divine arrangement or order as he calls you in. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. And may you have a wonderful week until we meet again next week. God bless.